Hi everyone on Zoom, sorry for the delay. Starting right away. Yeah, so hello everyone. Sorry for, for being a bit late. Um, I was actually, so I stumbled upon uh, one of the faculty in applied math, and she was uh, Vanessa Johnston, and she was telling me about how they're trying to develop a new vaccine for cancer and, and how they even need some uh, help with machine learning to analyze the data. And sort of like, so we had a very interesting conversation, and it kind of shows a bit how, you know, machine learning and, and AI can be used to, you know, to all these kinds of problems and like, not just like games, you know, in the case of um, Pac-Man and these ages, but also, you know, real medical problems. And uh, anyway, uh, so we had a, a bit of a conversation on that. And um, uh, for, for those of you on Zoom, uh, which you'll hear me, so I forgot my headphones today. So... In case you hear me worse, I'm sorry. You, you'll just have to look on the on the lectures uh, on on the recording. Sorry, so there will be recordings available in case you have if I have trouble with the audio quality. But otherwise, uh, I don't think there's that many of you. I have seen only five or ten. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, so today uh, we're going to continue what we spoke about last time, which was about Markov decision processes and, and reinforcement learning. Um, last, last time we, uh, as you remember, we started, so in the last two lectures, we already started covering Markov decision processes, what they are. Um, and then we, uh, we spoke about the Markov property, uh, uh, functions, utilities of functions, and then um, value iteration, policy iteration. And I think that's where roughly we stopped about the value iteration, policy iterations and more hybrid approaches. So today we're going to um, continue that. Before I have a few announcements, so mostly um, worksheet four is due this, this Friday. Um, uh, project two is due on Sunday. So these are the next deadlines coming up. Uh, again, as, as always, if you have any questions, post on Piazza or contact uh, us during the office hours. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's get started. So. So today we're going to talk about reinforcement learning, which is a big and a very important topic in, in AI. And, and we will talk about two big ideas. Uh, so can somebody tell me what, this, uh, what these two functions were representing so far? Somebody? Yeah? R is the reward, yes, yes, that's correct. And T is, what was T? Somebody else. Yeah, the transition function. Yes. Well, more more exactly, what and what do these symbols mean? Well, what is S? What is S prime? Yeah. Exactly. So from state S, we take an action A, and then we end up in state S prime. Well, so what's the probability that this happened? That that if you're in state S. And if you take the action A, then that, that you'll end up in set as prime. That, that is what this means. Uh, so we'll talk about two approaches. So first of all, what, what happens? No. So we're going to talk about what happens when we don't know 
the transition probability t and the reward function r. Oftentimes, for many problems, we actually don't know them. We don't know how to design good rewards in our, for our environment. And we all often don't know if we're in a new environment, we don't know the transition probabilities. Yeah, so um, especially, so again, if, if, especially if we're in a new environment, like if we, if we put our robot somewhere where it hasn't been before, it won't know these, uh, these values. So then these are unknown. So then we'll talk about approaches that, uh, that can handle the fact that we don't know these, these functions. So, and there's two main approaches. One of them is called model-based, where we basically learn a model of these functions. We learn a model of the transition function, and we learn a model of the reward function, like an approximation. For example, we can assume they, are, they follow some sort of parametric function, and then we learn those parameters. Same, same for, uh, no, sorry. Uh, on, on the other hand, we can also do model-free approaches where we don't, uh, we, we don't, we don't um, learn an intrinsic, expl an explicit model of, of the MDP. We learn empirically what the Q values and the, v, uh, the values are, basically the, the, the Q states and, and the values of, of our states. We learn them empirically. We'll, we'll see how through sampling, we'll, we'll approximate them through multiple samples. And then we, we take averages over samples. That's the idea today. So, so let's, um, let's recap a bit. So the Berman equations were telling us that the, the idea of the optimal utility leads to a simple one-step look-ahead relationship among the optimal utility values. So if you remember, this is we know already we've seen it before, the optimal value of V star at state S is a maximum over, uh, over the Q states where we take the maximum, uh, we take the best action possible. So the, the best action that maximizes the Q state, the optimal Q state. Now the optimal Q state, so which, is, which means the optimal value of being in a state and taking an action A is a sum over all possible states as prime we can end up in times the reward plus the discounted future reward, which is the value, optimal value of that state. So it's the current rewards that we get plus discounted future rewards, which is what the value mean. So then this gives us, if we combine the first and the second, it gives us a third equation again, which you have, and you've seen this also, how we get the optimal value, V star of S is given uh, as an equation in terms of the same optimal value, V star, these other ones for the other states as prime where we end up in and and and, and where we take the maximum uh, action the best possible action and then we sum over all possible states as prime we can end up in and this is uh, this operation also the sum of all as prime is also called marginalization in some uh, other fields and for example in statistics in probability some of you might have seen this term marginalization you marginalize over this Random variable as prime. Okay. Um, any questions? So this is uh, this is these are things that you, we have already discussed about. Um, any clarification? Is, is it okay for everyone? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we um, we saw value iteration last time. Um, one second, let me, let me, yeah. So we saw that, we saw this also last time. So this is not new. So we, we start with, in value iteration, we start with all the values being zero. Then we calculate uh, at iteration zero, then we calculate the, the value at iteration i based on the, the previous values at iteration i minus one. Uh, or or so, uh, similarly, so, so the, the, the equation of the values at iteration i plus one is given in terms of this equation and is given is given by the values at state i at region i and and again we keep doing these over many iterations we update all the values on our board so this is called one value update or Berman update and we repeat until it converges so okay so let's 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 look at this example in uh, in MDP and so we have several states we have, for example, let, let's say that this is describe your, your day, your average day. Uh, so you wake up, 
then with the with the probability of 40 percent you and you go running uh, or with the probability of 60 percent you do some coding and you get some rewards for running at a reward of 50 for coding with a reward of 40. Um, after running you can choose with 80 percent probability to eat um, and then uh, with a probability of 100 percent you end up speaking and so on and you have all these all these dependencies so um, so let's um, let's do a class exercise let's try to compute the values uh, at equation two so even though we know that the values at equation one are zero for all the states so let's do one equation manually and try to compute them um, how about how about uh, we'll do this as follows so I'll, I'll do one example on the board and and you pay attention and then uh, you'll do the rest of the remaining ones so i'll do the uh, value for for the first state for wake up so let's compute it manually um, okay so Maybe this here, so I can see it. So we have so the value of of the value is given for, for a specific state. So we'll do it now, right now for the wake up state. So for so value for wake up. Um, is equal to what? So what was the formula for for the value? Yeah, well, well uh, somebody, somebody, what was the, yeah? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, so, um, so we have to sum over, we have to actually take, take a maximum over the actions, max over, over A, um, No, um, hmm. so we sum over all possible states as um, that it can end up in. So, so, so here we sum over all possible states as prime of T of wake up, given a particular action, and then as prime of the reward of being in state wake up. Taking action A and ending up in S prime plus gamma times what? Yeah. yeah. And the value of S prime. Correct. Can somebody can can you can you see it over here? The angle is not great, now. Oh. Mm. I don't know if those of you can see over here. Um, I'll write it further down for A plus gamma times V of S prime. Yeah, so um, okay, so um, so this is the formula. So, so for this example, this gives us um what's the sum what are the what are the two possible um states as prime we can end up in so so with the probability of 40 percent no let, let's take the first one let's take the code first so with the 60 percent 0.6 which is t this t of and uh, the up with in the code state we take no let, let me let me write it out because It'd be better having more space. So we can take, so we have wake up, take an action A, and then end up in code times R of code plus gamma V of code plus P of 
wake up a and what's the other action run and the reward of the state run plus gamma v of run. Does this make sense? So I've just expanded this the sum of all the states. Yeah. So there's only two possible states we can end up in in this MVP. And this is equal to um what's this transition? This is with code, this is a 0 0.6 times R code 40 plus gamma is 0 0.8 times what's what's this? It's it's zero, yes. This is V1, right? This is these are the values from the previous iteration. So now we can get in V2 here at iteration two. Uh, so this is this is zero. Yeah, so this is zero like that. Plus zero point four times reward fifty plus zero point eight times zero, which is equal to zero point eight times forty plus zero point four times fifty. Which is equal to twenty four plus twenty, which is equal to forty four. Yeah, so so that's so that's how we compute the value of of a state of weight up. But this is this is and this is of course in general the. Um, this is over taking any expected uh, any action with these probabilities, but but we can also maximize. You know, we can take a specific action. We can maximize. We can also apply a maximum over over this action, and then in that case, we'll just get um, no. Actually, actually, I'm wrong. So in this example, the action is the same for all of them. So it, it, the action is the same for we take the same action here, a, and we end up with sixty percent. Probability in the code state and with 40% probability in the run state. So let's keep it simple like that. But in general, we can take an action. So, so, okay, so now the question is can you do this for the other states? So that's as, a, and let's take uh, seven minutes.
que vous dis non. You don't have to go through all the steps. You can change it down like this. Okay, let, let's do a short poll. Um, what did you get for the value of this state, the code? Somebody? 35. 35. Uh -huh. What about this one? E? Zero. And run? Yeah. 10 and 32. Uh -huh. Somebody value. Okay. Um, uh, I don't have the answer. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but I, it would basically mostly to get you to understand these uh, how you apply it to each. So, you see, it's not that difficult, right? We just apply these, these equations and we can see the values for all the things. And it's already five here. Um, so this is exactly what our equation is. And it is a lot of five. And we will see the computer, you know, by by the algorithm in all the demos last time. But um, that's exactly uh, what's going on. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Yeah. Gamma is a bit, uh, what does gamma mean? That was the question. So gamma is the discount factor. Um, it, it, it represents how much you discount future rewards. So that means that if you get a reward uh, one step later, you discount it by, uh, by 20%. So you only keep 80% of the reward if you get a step later or two steps later. So that's what it means. Yeah, another question. So when we went through the first four right now, we two in this one. Uh, yeah. In the equation, we want to use the discount factor gamma times V of X prime. In this case, it would be zero for V of X prime. And then they were right on V3, then we reduce the V2 value. Yes. Yes, exactly. 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 So at next time when we do for V3 here, we use the values we got for V2 in here. So this this was also the two. No, this is the one, this is the one, one, the three is the two. And so on. So every time we build on the on the values from the previous iteration, we compute a, a new value. Yeah, I see some confused faces over there. Okay. Uh, all right, so let, let, let's move on. So let's move on and talk about reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a really important uh, algorithm that is used in robotics and, and framework of thought. So, uh, and this is, this, is, this is what state-of-the-art uh, algorithms on robotics uh, use. So, uh, and, and it's basically the idea of what we spoke so far, but without knowing the transition function and without knowing the reward function. Let me show you an example of this like pancake flipping robot so to you see the idea. So. Um, So we have a robot that's, that's trying to flip, learn to flip pancakes. And, and we have a human that is demonstrating to the robot how to move the arm 
in order to, to successfully complete the action. So, so the human is showing it initially. And, and the robot uses the reinforcement learning to, to try to flip it uh, itself. And you see it's, it's having trouble uh, early on in the, in the algorithm. So even after 10 trials, it hasn't learned how to, how to implement it. I think nothing after 15 trials. <laughs> and, and now it's, they, they're trying to make it use motion capture. So they're using cameras that I put, you see how they put around the, around the, the robot here to, to try to track the, the pancake and sort of like learn better. Um, and, and with these cameras, they, they're getting better signal and basically better um, um, rewards. And, and they eventually successfully managed to learn the skill after 50 trials. So it's probably by now flipping Panky is better than me. Uh, so um, yeah, but you see how it's 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 interesting. So uh, it it was using a combination of initially the the human was demonstrating the robot to the robot. So remember, um, so here, um, so we started with the, with human demonstrations initially. So, so that, that, was the, that was the only input the robot had initially, the only kind of examples. And then over time, it was when, it, while also interacting with the environment, they, it, it, was, um, um, it was able to learn more. And the, the, this, this, this concept is actually called imitation learning. We have, a, and they have an expert or a human trying to show some successful examples to the robot. So it's trying to then imitate by, you know, with this imitation learning, it will imitate those kinds of, yeah, uh, examples. Um, Okay, um, so yeah, um, so this is this. These are the types of uh, yeah. So we put the learning is exactly this idea. So it's trying to um, you have an environment. You have we we assume what we have so far. We have a model that transitions from a state S to another state S prime. We have a reward function R, which is when the pancake actually gets flipped or not at the end. Um, but we don't now, now um, and we're still looking for a policy phi of s, but now we don't know, as I said, we don't know the transition function t or the reward function r. And, uh, and, we, and, and we're trying to, and we have to learn them as, as we go in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the environment, as we take actions. So, so passive learning is uh, this idea that you don't know the transitions, you don't know the rewards, um, and, and the goal is to learn the state values. Um, and and this this is basically kind of an idea of of you trying to learn uh, you're you're like kind of like along for the ride you basically as you, as you uh, along the ride you're learning um, what what T is what R is and then you can learn a, an optimal policy. So we we have and also we have no choice over actions. What actions you take you can often take like random actions, uh, or or you just have a random policy and you execute that. And then over time, you learn from experience from that uh, given a fixed policy, what are the transitions and the rewards of, of these states. Uh, and we'll also get later on into the active case soon where we start deciding what actions you actually take. Um, so, so and, and just to clarify, this is not offline planning. You actually take these actions in the world and see what happens. It's sort of like you, you have a fixed policy. The policy is fixed right now. And you just take um take follow the policy like as you see here this is our policy you follow this policy and you learn the transition functions t and reward functions r this is what we're talking about right now this is the setting and later on we'll talk about how we also uh learn the policy without having assuming it's fixed but for now we're assuming a fixed policy and we're trying to learn t and r so let's see an example of this so so with this policy um that we have here on our grid world we generated two episodes. So this is one episode where we basically start from state one one. This is a state, 
action and reward. So we start in state one one, we go up and we have a reward of minus one. Then we uh, we end up in one two. So and then from one two we go again up and we um, get a reward of minus one and so on. And and you still notice how even after we went up, it actually it was sort of stochastic. So the, the robot ended up turning left, so it bounced up and we, it stayed again into one two. So we had to try again to go up, and then it end, ends up reaching one three. And then we go right two three, right we go to three three. And then we, we, when we execute right, actually here, we end up bouncing off uh, south down in a 3-2. Then we try to go up again, and then we go right, and then we finish. So this is, this is one execution, one example execution of our algorithm, one episode. And we can generate multiple episodes like this. This is one, one example. We can generate a second episode, which finishes faster takes a different different path and ends up finishing faster at the done state. And you see, notice how this one ends up with the, in the good state with, the, with plus 100, and this one ends up in the bad state with the reward of minus 100. And we generate many, many of these episodes. And from these episodes, we learn T and R, the transition and the rewards. Yeah. Um, here's an example of how um, actually, is an example of how we can learn the values, so spotting the values of, of a state from these episodes. So, for example, for for computing the value at state two three, which is two three, which is this red state, we sum up the expected future rewards. So, so for the for uh, how many times we see this state two three in our episodes, so we see it once here, and also once here. So, so from this episode, from this episode, if we execute to the end, we get plus one hundred. But since we discount these rewards along the way, for, it's four steps away. We have one hundred minus four, which is ninety six. From this other episode, from two three, we end up with reward minus one hundred, and we also discount three steps, but it's three steps away, so it's minus one hundred and three, and. We take the average, and that gives us minus 3.5. And that's, for example, like a, a very naive direct evaluation of the values from these episodes. So we can use these episodes to uh, estimate the value of, our, of the state from, from, the, from these episodes, so from, uh, from these samples. For example, if we have a state 3.3, 3, we actually observe it three times because we have it once here, we have it again here, and we have it once in this other episode. So we have it, we've done it three times. For each of them, we can compute um, the expected future values, future rewards from them, discounted again by minus one and so on. And then we divide by how many there are, I think the average of that. And notice again how uh, this, this, this is a more of a naive approach. It's, it doesn't work that well in practice for many reasons, in particular, notice how. Um, there's such a big difference going you know, from between this state and this state. You know, you know, in fact, this thing happening that doesn't go this way, but because of all, you know, yeah. Um, because of all, unlucky here, you go, you go down and you get this point, then it ends up having super high value. So, um, so we can do better than this. We can do better than, than this direct evaluation. Um, and, and we can do, better by using the development equations. So, um, and we can simply use um, the development equations to, to calculate V for a fixed policy. So, um, so this was, these were the development equations for under uh, fixed policy pi. Again, uh, the, the values V under, under policy pi equation I plus one are given by the values V at equation I and doing this equation and summing over all the state S prime. Um, so again, the, the problem is we don't know T and R. We don't know the transition T and the reward R. So we have to estimate them. And the idea is to do what's called a model-based learning is to basically learn a model empirically that we experience of T and R. And solve for the values as if the model were correct. So, um, we can, for example, do a simple uh, counting approach where we basically count the outcomes of each state and action, and we normalize them to give an estimate of T 
SAS prime of the transition probability. So, and then we discover R, the, the reward as we experience the new status prime. Um, so let, let, let me give you an example. So um, imagine your, imagine you have this MDP, if you have a node here, you take an action, you end up here, where another action can go here or here. So, so you, you, can, you can do many episodes and count how many times you, you take this path, for example. Like, you know, you, you see um, two samples here, you see three samples here, and you see one sample here. So what this means then is that, um, and this is, uh, this, these are the new states as prime um, equals, yeah, um, Basically, these are basically different states. So I call it as prime, as double prime, and as triple prime. So then you can say that the transition for S A S prime is is by, by normalizing it. We basically do is two over two plus three plus one, which is two over six, which is one over three. And the, and the same for transition for S A S double prime is three over the same over all the whole sum two plus three plus so it's one over two and so on. So so that that's what we mean by normalizing. So you count up how many times you end up taking following those paths and then you normalize by the amount. And then, and these are probabilities. This is one over three and so on. Um. um So that, that's the example of doing this in, in our, uh, yeah, in our grid world. So again, with the, with the same two episodes, we compute. So, so the transition from going from three, three uh, and taking action right and ending up in four, three is one over three because only once out of three times we observe this. So three, three was here. We had it here, we had it here and also here. We observed it three times, but only once it ended up in four three, which is uh, which is um, here. This one, this transition happened only once out of three times. So that's why we say that probability is one over three. Same for this other red one. Another example. So from two three, taking right and ending up in three three is uh, two out of two because both uh, both times we observed this, it actually happened. This transition happened. So this, this is an empirical estimate of the of the solar energy function from the samples. Any questions? Anyone? Um, so um why, why don't we take a short five minute break and we we'll continue afterwards? So we go into these um, temporal difference learning now. Thank 
Okay, shall we continue? There was something that I forgot to mention in the previous slides. So when we were talking about uh, approximating T and R, we generally do know them as such with these hacks, which basically means this is a now an approximation of T and R that we're trying to learn from uh, from data from these episodes. So this is how we don't know them. This is, we don't we don't know them anymore. We don't decide on T and R. Um, and yeah, so uh, so now we, we we spoke about how we estimate this additional function t from um, from these episodes. Um, and I think in the break I still heard some uh, some confusion about what t was. Is it is it clear by now for everybody what what the benefit of the t is? Yeah, um, if, if somebody is not clear still about what t represents. Okay, okay, okay. It's a little noisy. Which one? This one? Yeah. And then it's action A. So, so in that case, we recently, in that example, we assumed that the action is the same in all cases. And we just, like in the like example, we did the same action everywhere. And it just happened that with, with the, yeah, with the system technology end up in this state, with, for example, we did that state, after doing the same action. So the, 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 um, yeah, it's a simplification. In practice, you will also have access to the same. Um, so the key would just modeling the challenge probability of even of taking the same action but ending in the same, you know, code or run. Does it make sense? It's like um, it's like the robot. It's like here um, in our real world. What was that? Uh, uh, here, yeah. So here you take an action to go up, but you, you're not guaranteed to actually end up in the, in the upstream from one one to one. With a certain probability of 10%, you can end up here, you can end up being right. Yeah. So so even if you go up, you end up up going with 80% of the time. But you also uh, uh, and, and here you end up with 10% of the time. But you can also choose to actually take the action to go right, and then you end up here with any kind of time. Yeah. So, so actions are, yeah, they're, they're different from the, you know, the different probability takes into account both the action date and the probability of landing in the same time. We have both these components. Okay. Um, So we learned how to estimate E. What about R? How do we estimate, you know, uh, no, so how about V? Sorry, but that's the learning the value we from from experience. So one way we can learn from, from examples is by using what's called that for distance learning. So the idea is it's a big idea, is basically that you learn from, from experience, from, from, from every experience. So every time you we see uh visit a new state as prime with a particular reward we update the values of that state um so uh update the value this should be s prime so it goes prime on us and 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 of course the library we will visit the next prime more than us not just once and we, we can end up refining this so so the idea is that we take a sample of of a sample of the variation of the value of state x by basically observing the reward of S prime and and computing the discounted value under the policy pi of say S prime. And given this sample, this one observation of, 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 the, of the state, we can update the value of state S with, with basically about by saying that this is equal to with a certain weight is, is equal to the previous value estimate. So, and this is called the temporal difference learning. And, and afterwards, um, or we can also we can also rewrite it like this. We can, so we can rewrite it like this, which is V of S is V of S plus this uh, alpha and this is the same something. Um, and 
And the idea is that um, we, every time we see these, again, we see the samples, we update our value. And then over time, these, the old values get discounted, or, or the old observations on the very past get forgotten. You know, and the new ones are the ones that really matter. It's the only things that, that, that still really count. Um, depending on what the, the price of the alpha here is, how much you wait, and it's because of how much we put emphasis on the new experience, on the new sample. So, um... And the, this idea is basically based on a fundamental concept called the exponential moving average, which tells us that if we have, uh, if we have a series of numbers, x, n, x, n minus 1, x, n minus 2, and so on, we basically compute the average, this exponential moving average, as, as a weighted average where, where weights are 1, 1 minus alpha, 1 minus alpha squared, and so on. So, so it's a geometrically increasing uh, um, series while well, exponentially while well, the exponent is increasing, but these uh, so this alpha is the number between zero and one. So one minus alpha will be between zero and one. Um, right in here. So so this so alpha is between zero and one, which generally means that this this weight is is decreasing more and more as we raise it to the power of two to the power of three to the power of and so on. This will decrease, um, and that means that the, these first, these last observations count much more than the than the ones in the past. Um, so the, this idea forgets about the past, and and again it takes much more in, uh, into account the present. And we can also write it as as this. We, we can also compute it using the running average formula. So so x n bar now is equal to x n uh, minus one bar times one minus alpha plus alpha times xn. So it's very easy to update the running, the average, this average, using this running average formula. We don't have to store all our, the, our entire sequence into memory. We just store this, uh, this accumulator, this, this, this running average. So that, that's why it's very, it has a very, this has this very nice property, so it's very popular. So let's see how this works in this example or with our grid world again. We have two episodes, our two episodes here. We have our Bellman update equation. We have our policy here. This is our policy, which, which are the actions we're going to take. And to compute the, the value here, the value under policy pi at uh, state 1, 1 is initi are initially all zeros. And afterwards, after we, when we do the first update, the first iteration, so they become 1 minus alpha times times the previous values from the previous iteration, plus alpha times uh, the reward plus the discounted value under policy pi uh, of one, two, of any up in one, two. And this is, so is this, uh, if alpha is 0 0.5, then this is one minus 0 0.5 times zero because the initial value is zero, plus 0 0.5 times the reward is minus one. For, for one step because we're losing yeah, one. This is the reward for doing one action and not reaching the goal state. Plus the value again, the discounted value and the value again was zero. So this ends up being zero. So this, so this in total, the value after one iteration would become minus 0 0.5. What is the formula? Any questions? Yeah. What was that? What? Alpha stands for. It's it's basically how much weight um, you put on the sample. It's like how much weight you put on the present, on the very on this the sample and on the last. Like so, for example, if alpha. Um, let me give you two examples. Oops. So if alpha is equal to 0 0.9, then you have emphasis on the present. They have very emphasis on the present samples or the very last ones. If alpha is, for example, 0 0.01, 
then you have an airflow states on I, I would say on the past, but in practice it means it's a very slow decay curve. So that kind of means you kind of take into account almost like everything, including from the even the present, but also even the, the distant past, you take it into account in your reward. So that, that's what it means. Um, because if we do one minus alpha, for example, so the one minus this one to the power of 10, which is 10, 10 steps ago, this will still be a high number, relatively high number. This will be 0 0.99 to the power of 10, still something like like 0 0.9, let's say, you know, so it's, um, um, it's again, it, 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 you know, you, you, you don't forget the past, maybe like that, you, you do not forget the past, you, you remember the past. Any other questions on this? It doesn't make sense. Now let's ask the question. Uh, if you have any, any other here, then now is a chance to move on to some other concepts. Okay. Um, so, so there are some uh, problems we have with temporal difference value learning. And in particular, it's quite hard to turn these into a new policy because even though we have these examples, we uh, we cannot take the argmax or you know like that over over these uh, actions easily because um, uh, because we don't have um, uh, again we, we have these empirical models so we actually we only compute in the value states and here we not uh, with with this value iteration and we just did we do not even computing estimates of t so. Um, so the idea how we can do this is actually to learn the Q values directly. So to learn them as Q values. Uh, so, and this, this brings us to the very powerful concept of Q learning, which is what uh, is used in many of sophisticated algorithms in, in, in AI. So, so the idea is that we're trying to learn the Q value of S and A. Now, this, this, is, this is the, Remember the Q value is the value of a state and also a particular action. It's, it's what the value of taking this action A at a particular state S. And we can approximate it empirically from our episodes. And this is what Q learning means. So, so from the Berman equations, we have that the optimal Q value, Q star, is again the, given by the Berman equation recursively in terms of Q star again. We take samples. From our episodes, so we, these samples are states that we visit, which give us rewards and uh, discounted future Q values. Um, and then we, uh, we 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 basically use this to learn. So um, we consider um, we we basically build a, a similar strategy of building a running average. Over over these Q states uh, as follows. So basically, Q of S A is one minus alpha times the previous value of Q and S A plus alpha times the sample. And the sample is this: is again the reward plus gamma times uh, the maximum over over the actions of Q and S A. So the same idea, but just with Q states. Only a few things change. Now you have you have a maximization here over the actions, but otherwise it looks very similar to what we had before. Um, and this allows us to to have a, to get an estimate of the of a, the optimal policy. Can somebody explain why uh, Q learning is preferable over, over value, le learning values? So, so why do we want to learn over Q states than over value states?
Okay. It's called Q learning because we're working with Q states. This is a Q state, Q of S and A. A Q state is a pair of a state and an action. That's simply what a Q state is. It's a pair. It's it's a pair of states and actions. So so we don't consider just like, um, well, like let's let's take our our grid world. So you know we have these squares, and and we have to, we, we we can take an action which is to go. You no, know, this is a particular state which is one one, and we also have to take an action to go up. So a Q state is, for example, in our robot world, is one one, and going up. This is. A key state. So state and action. And um, and now the, the, the whole idea with again with Q learning is that we're doing the learning over state and actions together. So why so why is this better? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe the first one is uh, they can be like more faster, like because they don't like to uh, like no, it, it's more since you say. Value learning is um is uh, is faster, right? Uh, like a Q Q uh, you're saying that Q learning is faster. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody else? Any other ideas? So, so um, I think I haven't actually I haven't benchmarked them. I, I'm, my intuition is that they might be quite comparable actually in terms of speed, Q learning and value learning. The um, the difference is that with Q learning we get um, we get um we get a policy we get the optimal policy right away so 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 we get q values we get we get to estimate these q values um with q learning so we get estimates of q of s a for all states and actions in our in our board so basically then we get we get a value for you know for q of one one and going up we get a particular number, let's say 0 0.4. We get the same Q, Q value from the same state, but now going down, which is 0 0.1, and so on. And then we can choose, we can we can choose the optimal action by seeing which one of these numbers is the highest. It's very simple. We just have a table of like, you know, we have four Q values for all the four actions, up, down, left, right. We take the maximum one, and that, that will give us, let's say, this one. This will be the maximum, and that will give us the optimal policy because we know that we know that in that state, in state one one, we have to go up. Give us the policy right away. So that that's one key reason why you learn is you know, preferable to value learning. So and and Q learning is also amazing because it has some other properties which are very nice. So um, in particular, one uh, one thing is that it doesn't you don't even have to follow the optimal policy. You can even follow a non-optimal policy. The algorithm will still converge, which I think is just mind blowing actually, if you think about it. So with Q learning, we don't. For example, let's say with this state, in this is the real world. This is our start state. <laughs> Uh, I'll do for the same for the zoom. So we start here in S, 
we end up in a state E. Let's say the optimal path is in red, is the ones in red, you know, go straight. With Q learning, you can still end up taking a suboptimal path like this and go like that and go down. It, uh, the algorithm will still converge. It will still find that the optimal path is, is this one, even though you don't necessarily follow it. You never even ex experience it once. It can still converge to that. It does a form of off policy uh, learning. So um, because you experience these states, um, may maybe at some point in one episode, you, you go like this just for a few, for a few squares and you go up, and then you go uh, reach the end. In a different episode, you go, you start to go up and then you converge to here. Over many, many runs, you will, you will learn that what is the optimal policy without you, you, you even following it. So it doesn't, it actually doesn't matter how you select the act. Yes. Uh, so for like the noise, like for Q learning to find the solution, do we require noise? Yeah, and that's what you're asking. Um, no, I think you, you, it could, it could still convert even if it follows optimally, like you know, just without without noise, it, it should still be able to convert. It, it, but it was uh, like the the state score is not high now. The state score is not high. I, I don't know what it was. Like, like, the, like the Q state is not the, because you do not for a possible path. Like maybe the Q learning, Q state uh, score is not high enough for what I'm trying to find out about the state. Yeah, 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 exactly. So so that that that's the idea of uh, Exploration. You, you, even though you might know the optimal path, you're still exploring other regions of the state because it might be a, an even better one. It is a more optimal one that you haven't discovered yet. So that, that's the idea of what it does. So you want actually to explore. We'll, we'll talk about that shortly about exploration, exploitation. Yeah. yeah, but in general, you want to explore for the possibility you might discover an even better path. Any other questions? Okay, so, uh, and this, this brings us, this, this actually fits very nicely because it brings us the idea of active learning. We have, so um, so now, so far, we had the fixed policy. We were operating in operate the company that we had, we, we had the fixed sort of actions that we take. We were just learning T and R, but now we don't even have a policy anymore. We have, we have to learn to make choices. And this is, this is a, there's a fundamental, this fundamental trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Which is basically how do we um, sometimes, especially early on, it's better to explore the environment to learn where are the good states where we have good rewards, what are the transition functions roughly. So we explore the environment, and once we have explored to a considerable extent, we can start exploiting the, the good states. We can start exploiting and, and accumulate as many rewards as we can. Um, so that's the idea of exploration versus exploitation. Um, uh, does it make sense? So, uh, and how do we, so the question is, how do we explore? How do we go to, uh, how do we decide to go to unoptimal state, let's say? So exploring here means that we actually don't follow exactly the optimal path. We can start behaving and say, oh, well, I have to go to this state. What do I have to do? We haven't said before. So, so one way we can explore is by taking random action. So, Sometimes we, we, yeah, we take random actions, for example, with, with a coin flip. For example, with the probability epsilon, we act normally, with probability one minus epsilon, we, um, sorry, with probability epsilon, we act randomly, and with, with one minus epsilon, we act according to the policy. This is what's called epsilon greedy uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so, so there's some problems with this approach, which is that you do explore and have the space, but we end up trashing around um, basically once learning is done. We end up kind of like way on behind and, and wasting uh, rewards, basically. So one solution is to actually lower the epsilon over time, because we make it smaller and smaller. And uh, so initially, early on, we do a lot of random actions. Uh, uh, later on in the game, where we take a few of those. Um, and another solution of this is to use what's called exploration functions. 
So in, in the idea of exploration of functions that we have a function which kind of tells us how, you know, uh, how to take random actions, basically. Um, so the idea is that, um, so for actually, so don't, don't look up here, just look again. Uh, in the, we take these equations on the very bottom. Um, I know those of you on Zoom won't see. So here, from this equation, we end up to this one, where we modify the Q value to be now f of q comma n. And what this means, this f of q comma n, what this means is that we, um, u is basically our utility, our current utility, but we modify this current utility and we cap it by how many, by a value of k over n, which means where n is how many times we visited the state. And k is just a fixed constant. So, um, so, so the idea is that um, initially, so, so for k, k is a fixed constant, n is the number of times we visit a state. Initially, early on, we basically have, at the first visit, we have something like f, this f would be u plus k. At the second visit, it would be u plus k over 2. At the third visit, it would be u plus k over 3, and so on. So over time, this will basically, as we accumulate more and more counts, this f of u n will so, uh, so this is uh, this is an example of a function that encourages more again more exploration exploration of functions. Uh, um, does it make sense? So initially, and remember, initially, the, so say also say if we have never visited a state, the utility of that state is real, right? Because we've never visited before, so. So with this such an expression function, we still start with like a k over n utility. So we will the utility will still be capped at k over n at, at the very and so it still makes sense to explore it because we give we kind of give it some utility to start with. And over time the utility will increase. That this factor will go to zero and and the actual estimate of utility will be what happens Okay. Um, so so Okay, so um, so what what have we done so far? So we, we covered quite a few things today. So we covered um, what do we do when uh, in MDP when um, we have to compute the value, the, the optimal values, optimal Q values, and optimal pi exactly. Uh, and this is what is done with model based the um, decision processes. And we cover value permission and policy duration. Policy duration. And then we calculate about the fixed policy pi. Uh, so this, this was last week. So today we, we covered what we uh, what happens when we don't know the MDP. So when we don't know the transfer function P, the reward R. And this uh, brought us to model-based RL reinforcement learning and model-free RL. And here a um, model-based RL tells us that we can have a particular model, a particular model for P and for P and R. Like for example, based on counting, so like kind of counting how many times like this, how many times we uh, visit that particular transition probability, and then um, also model three, which basically is based on samples, we take samples, and then we use the exponential running average to uh, to update uh, the and series with the R bar. So this is an example, so I, I'm going to pick up stop here in this last time, but I'll, I'll show it here. So this is an example of Q learning done on our grid, where you now see, so, so we get Q values. Um, this is an example of that. So, so we, we, get, we get values, not just for each state, but for each action. So what the, this is the value of being in this state and going north, this is 0.84. And this is the value of being in this state and going north. Where? So I think this is what Q value Q learning learns all these different Q values, um, and and then we can learn the optimal policy. So here the optimal policy would be you start from one one, you take the maximum of the actually take this one, you go up, then again the maximum is this one zero sixty one, so you keep going up, and then 70, 78, 88, and then we reach the final. and that 
it gives you the option of policy right away. Okay, any final questions? Yes. Can you go back to the slide where it's like um, the function of um, U and N? So is yeah. an alpha being multiplied by R or the alpha mix? It's basically um, it's it's an alpha update. It's basically an update with the with the running average, you know, with sample. So basically, uh, what that means is you're doing this update from before this one, this one, like this. Uh, well, I, I, we have the same for Q G states. Uh, sorry, here yeah, this one, yeah. That's what that's what I mean. So so basically this this line exactly, and, and that one was showing here that you replace what's inside the bra the bracket the square bracket with that new expression. So you up, instead of Q star you do F of Q and then basically, that's what that slide was saying. So uh, the update is based on this alpha this alpha yeah an alpha update based on running average. It's like this is this one. Uh, so this is what we call. Oh, applying this this kind of update. Yeah, so the, the, that thing just comes, this thing on the right hand side just comes in, inside the brackets and it has to be pre-multiplied by the transition T. Um, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'll see you all in two days. Almost.